Hey there, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. I'm really excited uh, to have Michael Krieger, the author, editor, and creator of uh, libertyblitzkrieg.com. Definitely check out his website. He's got really amazing um, um, articles written. Uh, for example, um, uh, it's uh, a three-part series, um, uh, part one, localism in the 2020s, the Second Amendment sanctuary movement, uh, part two, uh, facial recognition, silence of being and beyond, and part three of the localism in the 2020s, scaling politics. And a bunch of other, you know, uh, articles. Uh, for example, another stupid war. Um, so, uh, what I really find fascinating about Michael Krieger is, uh, like many cases I know, uh, is a, like very fascinating person because he comes from the financial, you know, big money industry, New York, you know, whatever, Wall Street, uh, uh, Lehman Brothers, you know, oil analyst, equity research fund. So this is you can read, you know, his bio for yourself on libertyblitzkrieg.com on the about page. So he, as you know, he actually loved his job, he said, but um, to quote him, he said, as time passed by, um, started to educate myself about how to monitor financial system functions and what I discovered disgusted me. Um, and then he goes on, says, um, um, in the years followed, uh, gradually recognized that my true passion centers upon writing on issues of significant societal importance, given the extremely challenging times we live in. And this realization culminated with uh, me losing interest in financial markets and eventually launching this website in early 20, uh, 2012. So you can read it for yourself, read the articles, really amazing, fascinating. I'm really looking forward to, to this interview and really finding out, you know, what is the bigger picture? Because he, you know, he also writes. He he loves to write about the bigger picture macroeconomical, uh, you know, uh, uh, articles. So you know, what, what what do like people like Michael Krieger? What what kind of vision do do they have? What kind of bigger picture? What kind of uh, you know imagination or or comprehension do they have? What would would look like if Bitcoin becomes a monetary root layered or so much ossified and critical adopted, mass adopted? What is ha what what's going to happen to the individual? What's society going to look like? Like literally, what what is practically going to look like when everything is going to be freed? You know, technologies, freedom, to decentralization, more free markets. You know, more prosperity. I want to know. You know, all these. You know, these these individual views and and perspectives and insights. Anyway, so if you want to support me, please leave me a positive review on Apple Podcasts afterwards, or give me a. Uh, write me an email, hello at the totalconnector.com or kd at kvandabani.com. You know, find it on my site or in the show notes. And um, yeah, thanks so much for your support and for listening. And uh, reshare, retweet, like, love it, follow, and do everything else what you can do to, you know, spread this knowledge and information and educational uh, podcast. Thank you so much. Without further ado, this is my interview with Mike. Well, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Show. Michael Krieger is my special guest. Thanks so much for your time, Michael, for coming to my show. How are you doing? Absolutely. It's very, I'm very excited to be on your show for the first time, and I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. Michael, I've been following you. You, know, you have a really uh, fascinating background story and, and bio. So um, I myself, on my part, I have a, originally have a legal background. I did my PhD on product liability, you know, investigated uh, for many, many years the internal documents of the uh, cigarette corporations, the back industry. So uh, you know, there comes a time when you find, sort of, uh, you find your position, your conscience, and um, you know you go deeper into the rabbit hole from one thing to another. So, uh, but it's not about me; it's about you, uh, Michael. Why don't you just introduce yourself? So what's your path to Bitcoin? Uh, what is LibertyBlitzkrieg.com uh, about? Because I've been following your, you know, reading your articles. Really fascinating. I agree with a lot of things that you say. You know about uh, like community-wise decentralization, more autonomy, more self-responsibility, going more into the communities. Uh, so this is what I sort of picked up uh, from your articles. Uh, where, why don't you go to this ad and um, you know, tell my audience a little bit about yourself and your background, your path to Bitcoin also. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think we probably have a similar story in some sense because you know, I grew up you know, uh, in New York City, um, you know, privileged, um, you know, had, had good education, went to the right college. You know, I was sort of set up in this perfect path to just have this uh, 
super wealthy, you know, elitist sort of lifestyle um, working, working for the system, you know, essentially. And that's basically what I did from uh, graduating college. I went right to Wall Street. I started Lehman Brothers where I was a, I worked with the oil analyst, uh, equity research, did that for five years. Then I moved on to a firm called Sanford Bernstein, which is a specializes in research of industries and companies. And there I, I went on a trading desk and I did commodities in general. So not just oil, but you know, base metals, precious, you know, we didn't really do much precious metals, but a uh, natural gas, the drilling companies, service companies, all of that stuff. And so I essentially had 10 years in finance, you know, in the models, in accounting uh, of it, of companies, uh, trading markets, uh, as well as oil, which, and oil gives you a very geopolitical um, macro view of the world in a lot of different ways. You sort of opened your eyes to a lot of things. And, you know, my mind has always worked in a macro sense. So all of those things, you know, together, uh, essentially got me to 2000, the crisis, the financial crisis, which, which was, as you, as you mentioned, sort of that, con that moment of conscience where, you know, you sort of wake up. I mean, if, if I were a betting person and I saw my early life, I would never bet that I would become, you know, sort of this, uh, <laughs> this anti-establishment, anti-status quo person that, that I have become. It just didn't, didn't seem to fit. But something did, did break for me in that crisis period. Uh, you know, I started to understand more and more when I saw the Federal Reserve and the government's reaction, right, the obsessive reaction, corrupt, criminal, I would say, reaction to the crisis, uh, bailing out people like me, you know, people that were, I was sitting on a trading desk on Wall Street making a ridiculous amount of money for no real good reason, right? I mean, I, and I came to realize why over time I was, right, the Cantillon effect. I'm, I was close to the money spigot being on Wall Street. That, that's, just, that's just how it works. And I was in a favored industry, you know, an industry in a financialized economy, uh, the money goes there. It's one of the places the money goes. It also goes to defense contractors, for example, to maintain empire, you know, surveillance companies, all that stuff. Uh, but anyway, so, so with that background, when I saw the crisis, I, I started digging in, you know, what is going on? How does the monetary system really work? Believe it or not, I would say 95% of the people I worked with on Wall Street had no idea how the monetary system works. I mean, now it's a little bit more known, uh, but I'm telling you, back in 2009, people didn't even think about it. You know, they didn't even, weren't even questioning any of this stuff. They're just like making too much money and worried about their career. I was part of that. But I got curious and the more curious I became, the more disgusted I became essentially. I looked around me and I saw, you know what? There's all these people, they're now getting help from the government to maintain their careers, their money, while all the people that need help are not getting help. And I felt dirty about it. You know, I just felt like this is not, I'm not getting, because so much of being on Wall Street, I'll tell you, um, and making good money like that at a young age is about ego. You know, it's about stroking yourself and thinking you're great and you're better and you're this and you're that, whatever. Uh, it's part of human nature. It's part of what keeps people in, the, in that game. And that just dropped away from me at that point because I realized like, I'm not special, you know, I'm not great. I'm just happened to be pretty good at a job that gets paid a lot of money. And I looked around me and I was like, all these people here, you know, they're, they're not special. You know, they're just in the right seat and the government is propping up their bonuses. And, you know, for a lot of reasons then, it just, it was not interesting to me anymore. So I, uh, I ended up quitting in January, 2010 and uh, having no idea what, what I was going to be doing. And I still don't, you know, <laughs> to some degree, but I did know that I had something to say and that I couldn't continue along the path that I was, that was going on. So this is where Bitcoin sort of starts to come in. Now, at that point, when I left, I guess maybe uh, Bitcoin just launched. I mean, it's interesting to see because I left in January 2010. I think Bitcoin launched in January 29, 2009. So my, it was almost exactly one year without me knowing about Bitcoin at this point that I left uh, Wall Street. And I learned about, I learned about Bitcoin pretty early, um, probably in 2011, I would say. I, I first heard about it, um, but my initial thing was, uh, you know, because I was, I was into gold, you know, I was very into gold, which was normal for me, given that I had given up on the monetary system and all that. So I was, you know, but, but I did, I couldn't make sense of Bitcoin when I first heard of it. I was like, okay, well, this seems interesting, but what, you know, I, I don't have a tech background I, I, and I didn't have the time or, or will at the moment to dig into it. But come 2012, I was already very much in the rabbit hole of, uh, it's not just finance, it's everything that's corrupt around, me. you know, it's, it's every single industry I looked into, whether it was healthcare, defense, uh, big tech, it was all dirty. I mean, really dirty, evil, quite frankly. And, uh, and I realized the problem was much bigger than just finance. It was, it was the whole thing was corrupt to the core. 
intentionally so, and uh, designed to benefit a small group of people. So at this point, I you know was already into you know Assange and WikiLeaks and the work that they were doing, and I read an article describing how um, WikiLeaks was able to get around the PayPal and bank blockade, receiving donations by Bitcoin. And this was what, this was like that light bulb moment for me, where I was like, okay, this is real, okay, because because it's not just theoretical now. This is having an actual impact on um, resistance, essentially on journalism. This 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 technology, uh, and 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 then I then I asked my my good friend who's who's very very techy, um, very much in that world. I said, let let's talk about this. You know, what is this? How do you use it? Uh, is this real? Is it government conspiracy? All that stuff. And he and he, he walked me through it, set me up with a wallet. You know, at the time it was I think multi bit. Uh, and and by the way, at that time there were two ways to buy Bitcoin. It was uh, it was bit instant, or at least that I knew of. Bit instant uh, and Mt. Gox. And so soon after that, I decided to, I wrote about it for the first time publicly in August 2012. And I said, it was something, the post was something like a way to fight back against financial terrorists, Bitcoin, you know, and it talked about what I just discussed. Uh, I went on to figure out how to send some money to Japan and I bought some Bitcoin at Mt. Gox. By the way, when I was at the bank sending a wire to Japan, I remember thinking to myself, like, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing? <laughs> this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. And it ended up being the smartest. But, uh, and of course, like everybody, I wish I had done more. But it was, that was the journey. You know, that was the beginning of it. And um, so I came into it from a, from a spot in that, a lot of people say they learn about the financial system through Bitcoin. So they hear about Bitcoin, they, they, they find it interesting, and then they figure out how corrupt the system is. You know, I came from Wall Street knowing full well how rotten the system was. And Bitcoin, to me, when I learned about it, was sort of like, okay, this is what I've been waiting for. <laughs> you know, right. thankfully. And, and from that moment, you know, I will say from like 2009, right, to 2012, when I really started getting into Bitcoin, I was in a hole, you know, a dark place. It was like, you know, I don't see a way out of this. This is, this is bad. You know, what are we going to do? I couldn't see a way out. But then, I, but then when Bitcoin came, I was like, okay, there, there is a way out. There is, something is happening. Things are happening. And then I was able to develop a more optimistic outlook in general because um, I knew that Bitcoin was being worked on all along behind the scenes. And so if that's the case, there's stuff right now as we're talking being worked on behind the scenes by smart people, that know how bad things are. And the good news is people, way more people know how bad things are now than they did 10 years ago. So I'm expecting, you know, in the next 10, 20 years, a lot of new things to come out, not in the realm of cryptocurrency, but in the realm of all sorts of other things that will, I think, change the world after a very rough period. I do think we're entering a, a tricky period, but uh, I'm sort of a medium to long-term optimist, but a short-term, I'm pretty nervous. Mm -hmm. You know what I find funny because uh, we hear so many stories, uh, whether now you are uh, a techie or Austrian economist or, you know, so many genius people out there like Andreas Antonopoulos, Safed Anamus, they all brush it away, uh, like under, you know, like, like ignored it at first uh, because right. either they, you know, they didn't understand really how it works or the monet or they didn't, people are like myself, I had to learn, you know, where does money come from? We, we never learned that in school. So, exactly. When you understood like the monetary properties, the, the the total you know decentralized nature of Bitcoin, like what what kind of vision did you have? What, what, what was like the, the the aha moment where you said, oh, "Wow, this is like whatever uh, the absolute limit, the scarcity of Bitcoin, whatever it was." What was it? Yeah, well, okay. So so as I as I said, you know, that first moment was when I saw a practical use case in something I cared about, which is journalism, right? WikiLeaks. So that, that then I knew it was powerful. But then what really, the next thing was when I actually received, because people had said to me, you know, I want to give you Bitcoin, you know, for your work, let, you know, let take Bitcoin donations, you know, it was $10. And so I said, okay, let me do this. So then I set up the wallet, as I said, and I received some donations. And that's when I really, that was the next step for me. Because mm -hmm. when I actually used it and I started to understand, well, there, I have these private keys that are under my control and I can move this value anywhere in the world without a third party. And then I did it, right? I actually did it, uh, having it sent to me and then me, you know, sending it elsewhere. Then I, then it was like, that was the next level. You know, I understood the power of it, that, that nobody was doing it for me. You know, no, nobody, I didn't have to, there was no call center, you know, there was no company, Bitcoin company. And so what that did for me was 
beyond the monetary right um, stuff, which is important, Bitcoin to me is a teacher uh, beyond Bitcoin. Right. It, it teaches us, uh, I think, how we need to think about the world in general going forward. Uh, not just decentralization, but, well, decentralization is inherent in this, but, but concentrations of power, okay? Yeah. Yeah. The less concentrations of power that exist, the better. And in the case of Bitcoin, when, where nobody, right, no company and no CEO or government has the power is, is the best, particularly in something like money. And so I think these lessons can be applied to all sorts of different things. And, you know, as you mentioned recently, I, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a series on localism right now. I'm, I just published part three, which was more of a political philosophy essay uh, yeah. this past Tuesday. Yeah, it's really um, awesome, the articles, by the way. So it's the three pieces like localism in the 2020s, the Second Amendment sanctuary movement. The second part is facial recognition, right. Silutubin and beyond, which I really find fascinating. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the third part, um, which is localism in the 2020s, part three, scaling politics. So it's all, you can all read it on libertyblitzcreek.com, which I think really people should, should support your, your website and your work, uh, you know, in the background. Um, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, oh, no I really find it fascinating uh, because it all ties into, you know, because uh, when, I, when I ask people, like, what is your vision, like, once uh, like imagining or understanding that Bitcoin is the, you know, the foundational monetary root layering, what is the, you know, the bigger picture? What is the bigger vision behind Bitcoin? And right. uh, only few people can really like explain to me what kind of, ex uh, you know, uh, consequences, positive consequences that can have on every structure we can think of. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So if we're talking about localism, when, when people first hear it, they think, oh, you know, they think back to, let's say, like the Middle Ages or Dark Ages. And, you know, you have all these fiefdoms and they're fighting constantly and killing each other for land. That's not at all how I see it. And it, actually, I'm going to go into this much more in part four, which will deal with voluntary political unions and secession. Right. So exit. How do you exit? Um, so essentially, in part three of my piece, the key is about how it scales. So as you go from the, the primary unit of sovereignty, which is the individual, the next one I identify is the family, then the city and the count in the US it's or a county, because a lot of places are very rural. So it's, it would be more, there's no city, right? There'd just be a bunch of towns, then the state and then the federal government. And what I talk about is at each step of the way, you're giving up a little bit of your, your sovereignty, your individual sovereignty. But you need to think about um, voluntary giving, giving away. So when you, when you start a family, which I, which I have over the last five years, you know, you get into a marriage, you have children, you are willingly giving up some sovereignty, you, you know, for the greater good of the family. You have to compromise. You have to make the, right. You have to, you have to, your wife needs to be happy. Your kids need, there needs to be some structure. You need to agree on what that structure looks like, but it's a very family choice and it's very voluntary in most cases, but it is a giving up of your total individual sovereignty. You can't deny that. Um, and then the next level would be the city or the community. And that's, uh, and then you're giving up more, you know, you're living with other people in a defined geographic place. Usually that place has a, um, a particular vibe to it, could be more libertarian, could be more liberal, could be more conservative, doesn't matter, right? There, there is usually a, a sense of something, some culture to a place. And you, you, know, you, you either fit in there or you don't fit in, but you still like it and you wanna live there, or you can pretty easily move. Right? Within a country or even a state here, you get up and you can move to another. It happens. People do it all the time. So that's a pretty voluntary relationship as well. Once you're an adult, you, you know, you, if, you're, if, you, if you feel like this city isn't it for me, you can pretty much figure out a way to leave. It starts to get harder as you move up to the country level. Okay. How many people really consider giving up their citizenship? But it's, it's not that common. It's not that common because it's, it's not that easy for a lot of reasons. Language, completely different culture, uh, just the ability to get, let's say, a, a visa or residency or citizenship. It's not that easy. So that's why what I think we need to really dig in on, and this isn't necessarily Bitcoin related, but the country level, the, the provinces or states that make up a country, they're, 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 they need to really, there needs to be a way, a constant way. I think constant referendums, sort of like what you saw in, in, in the UK, Scotland even had theirs, Catalonia wants to have one. That should, be a, that should not be sort of an exception. It should not be radical. 
It should be part of the human experience. It should constantly happen. Catalonia should be voting on whether they want to be a part of Spain every 20 years or something, right? And, and, the, and the point here isn't to break up the states, but I believe by having that threat, it will keep the states, the, 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 the central government under control because they know yeah. every 20 years, right? So that's what I'm going to go into. But, it, but in a sense, it is Bitcoin related because it's, it is focused on decentralized units of governance, right? Based on a voluntary principle, but it also, with the, the power of Bitcoin is it is a global thing. You know, as decentralized as it is, and permissionlessness, you're, you're still, you're, you're, you're engaging in a very uh, free manner with humans all over the world. Uh, th th that's how I envision governance as well, on a, on a broader frame. So in other words, you could still have the United States and it could still be this, um, you could even apply this even globally at some point, but, but, but it needs to, the union needs to be voluntary. Okay, it needs, th 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 there's, th the, the problem, like let's say in the U.S., is is it is it voluntary at this point? I mean, secession is viewed as in the context of the Civil War and some horrible thought that could never be contemplated because it's very difficult to do in practice. Okay, it doesn't doesn't happen, right? But it but it should be my view is it should be part of the human experience, and I think that will encourage more connectivity because if 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 smaller units of people are voluntarily engaging with other units in the world, not just necessarily in the country, but around the world and creating unions that are fluid with exits and entries. I think that's the, again, the model I see um, for human political life governance. Will it happen in my lifetime? Possibly not, no, you know, maybe, maybe definitely no. But that's my philosophy. And, it, and, and Bitcoin helped me, uh, helped inspire it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's uh, such a, a funny a coincidence, sort of, because you're talking about secession or, you know, seceding from, and I just, you know, commented uh, to, um, I don't know, Giacomo Zucco and uh, Caitlin Long, and I said, why, you know, because, you know, Wyoming is sort of a, a prime example of a very progressive, you know, innovative uh, state uh, with all their so-called, whatever you want to call it, crypto laws and, and Bitcoin, pro-Bitcoin laws and, 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 and decentralization. So I, you know, so as you said, you know, it shouldn't be the exception. It should be actually part of the human experience, as you say correctly. Uh, and why, you know, I said not even jokingly. Why, why shouldn't uh, Wyoming be able or be allowed to secede from, you know, this whatever artificially created nation state? Because I'm, I'm not a believer in nation states. I'm not a believer in governments, and I definitely, you know, find the 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 structure and the uh, you know, the whole, um, uh, everything is going on with the central banks, totally criminal, but, uh, it's, it's sort of a pink elephant, which, uh, I'm not sure how, how deep can you talk about this whole bit bigger picture of nation states, governments, and central banks? Yeah. So I think, um, I think the, the, the proper, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to do this in part four. It's difficult again, because what I said what, with the history of the United States, when you start mentioning things like secession, you start thinking about slavery in the Civil War. It's a very emotionally charged subject. So, so for me, I want to I want to take it in a different direction, you know, and 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 not just for the U.S. And by the way, like I agree with you on the, on nation states. However, um, let's say municipal right. If if at the municipal level, that's where I believe. And by the way, there's this, there's a, there's a great book, and this guy is like a, an anarchist or even very much a leftist kind of guy. And I disagree with him on big time on a lot of issues. But the, it's his name is Murray Bookchin. He's no he's passed away, but he wrote a book uh, or a book of his essays called The Next Revolution. I wrote an article about this book. If anyone wants to look at it, uh, it's his essays, and he wrote, writes all about this, the history of of you know revolutionary movements and and this and that. And it's very interesting. But what he his final conclusion, and one I agree with, is that the political life of a human should be centered at the city or municipal level. That is where almost everything should be done. And it's like this quote I, I put in my last piece, like uh, Chester, Chesterson quote, um, keep, keep, keep the politicians close enough so that you can kick them. And I think that's, that's the idea here. Um, you're, 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 that's where, that's the most ethical, there's, there's, it's easy to exit out of a city and, and in a city is where you know your local issues best. You know how to deal with things and you gotta make the people happy there and you can leave quite easily. Um, so. But from that point, right, I just believe it's part of the human nature to expand relationships. It's just what happens. So we should accept that, right? Like th this idea that, 
that's going to go away, I think is unrealistic. So, so, so then the question is, how do we scale political relationships in, a, in an ethical and human manner, right? That, that doesn't lose sight of the, the core unit, municipal family individual. And my, my feeling is that those cities essentially, um, or counties then can engage in voluntary unions with other places. Um, but there's always a way to get out. They're not, they, 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 that's the thing. It's like with Spain, right? The Spanish government, their argument against Catalonia was Spain is eternal, right? The, the, the constitution says the, the, this country will be, you know, consist of Galicia, Catalonia, Andalusia, right? Uh, Extremadura forever, right? For the end of time, it's preposterous. And the only thing that that does is, is it creates a tension where the government, the central state is saying, you are here, and if you want to get out of here, you must be violent. It's a crazy choice. And if you look at any country in the world, it's, it's pretty much that way. Um, think about how hard it was for Great Britain to leave the EU, something that's like 20 years old. And it was so difficult, right? Um, imagine breaking up like Spain or, or, or even, even talking about it. But, but my, so my, 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 what I want to start talking about, because I believe we're entering a period right now uh, that could last a long time where things are going to disintegrate. Okay, the, the, the structures and ways that we've been doing things are going to be going away because of different uh, ideology and also failure, just system failure. Um, we need to have another vision. Okay, we need to put out other visions because if we don't do that, other people are going to do it for us. Believe me, they're going to do it for us. And they're going to want to create more centralized super states. Not like what I'm talking about, not, not where the power resides locally, and then you form voluntary relationships, but where you, you, you're, you're sort of encompassing all of these people, more and more people, under a technocratic centralized bureaucracy, which is the exact opposite of what I'm talking about. So I guess what I'm saying is, just like Bitcoin showed you that global money can be uncontrolled by a central entity, I believe that you can have larger political unions that are not centralized. And I think we need to think about how to structure that. I have some ideas, but I hope everybody thinks about this because like I said, if we don't come up with something, they're gonna come up with something for us. Right, no, totally with you on that, Mike. Uh, would you say transition is the key? Because, you know, making the transition as smooth as possible, we don't, we all don't want, you know, chaos, panic right. and, crashes coming and people suffering, you know, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in European Union. I mean, there's so many experts out there who, and I, I see it in the next one or two years, I think there's going to be some serious meltdown at the beginning in Germany and, you know, spreading out in European Union. So how, what is the solution? What is the effective? I mean, is, do you, um, first of all, my question to you, because you were talking about municipal, municipalities, and I know people, uh, people I, uh, my, for my impression is that people in America in the United States are more active. They're not as passive as people, you know, people over here are much more fearful, or conservative, or, you know, don't, don't touch this, don't touch that. But do you think people in America more, have a more wake up, uh, you know, attitude? Okay, so it's funny that you, it's interesting that you say that because you know I, I haven't been to Europe in a long time, and so I'm not. It's it's interesting to hear that on the ground because I get so frustrated in my own country really? thinking mm -hmm. we're, we're the most apathetic, passive people. So I think everyone sort of thinks everyone else is more active <laughs> than them. But yeah. I will say this: um, what we do have in the United States, and I don't know how familiar you are, you are with with our, our Constitution, right, which is still supposed to be the founding document, but I'll over, run over it real quick for, for maybe some of the Euro European listeners that are less familiar. I think that's where it comes from, um, that, that, that maybe there is more a willingness to shake things up uh, here, uh, because the founding document, right, and we don't follow it at all, so I just want everyone to be clear, the U U.S. is an imperial, what I call an imperial oligarchy. Oligarchy. No, right, it's like Rome. I mean, there's no, there's no freedom in an imperial oligarchy. There's no decentralization, really. There's just, it's, 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 it's centralized by, by definition, okay? And it's becoming more decentralized. However, we still have this thing called the US Constitution, which our leaders have to pay lip service to, because legally, I mean, structurally, that is America. You know, that is the country. So that's, that's where I think we have, where maybe you might not, we have an opening. I can come out and say, wait a minute, you swear an oath to this document. So let's talk about this document. You know, it's like when people say, well, you're anti-American, you're not patriotic. I'm like, okay, well, you tell me what America is. Is America bombs? 
you know, or is it the Constitution? It's the Constitution. So if you dig into that, um, what the founders did, right, which I agree with, but we can build on it even more and, and make it more decentralized, right, more, more voluntary, was create, do two things. First, there was an emphasis on decentralization of power, okay, by create with the colonies, now states, where, where in the 10th Amendment of the Constitution, it says everything that's not specifically given to the gov federal government is in the state's hands. So that was already de supposed to be decentralized. Again, we don't follow this in the US anymore because we're an empire, but that is what the founding document says. So right off the bat, the, the founders were, were, were obsessed, obsessive about um, decentralizing political power to smaller entities, which were the colonies. Um, the second thing was that even at the federal level, whatever power the federal level had, they were still paranoid. And they, they, they created checks and balances. And those are known as the three uh, branches of, of government in the United States. There's the executive, which is the presidency. There's the judicial, which is the Supreme Court and the judge and the, and the courts. And then there's the legislative, which is the Congress. And, and, and the tasks were divided very clearly amongst those. Again, we don't go operate that way anymore because the executive essentially does whatever it wants in a lot of cases, more so than it should. Centralization. It's an empire. However, it's in the document. So, so the founders of this country were obsessed with decentralizing power. They were, they were obsessed with um, uh, checks and balances and the Bill of Rights, which is one of the most important parts of the Constitution, does another thing, which it, which it specifically focuses on the inalienable rights of individuals, which as I talk about individual sovereignty. This isn't about, um, you know, telling people what they can do. It's about, it's about telling all forms of government throughout the land what they cannot do to the people. So there's a lot there. And I think that's part of it. I think we, we have this history and document that's not followed anymore, but that has a lot of profound, has a profound framework that we can build on. Now, one of the things I'll write about on my next piece about secession is that the constitution does provide for secession, but I think where they where they messed up actually, what I would do differently is not just make it this sort of extreme thing, but a regular voting thing. You know, mm -hmm. you, you need to regularly affirm your relationship to the whole because someone like me um, was never asked. You know, I was never asked to be part of an empire, you know, and you weren't asked to be born where you were in the government. So, so this is the problem. And I, and I wrote about this a couple of years ago with Catalonia. Human beings are just born where they are into the state and they're told that the state is forever and you have no choice really about it. We need, to, we need to put choice in there and it needs to be for everybody. Everybody deserves a choice to live under the sort of government that they want to live in and it should be put to a vote. Right, Regularly. But, the, but Michael, the problem is, I mean, I lived, uh, by the way, five years in California with my family, you know, back and forth, Austria, California. So, um, and you know, the, you know, there is something that you know there is somehow lovable about the American style of living. But coming back to the Constitution, isn't it sort of a toothless paper? I mean, yeah, as you said, yeah, people, you know, the politicians or whatever, they got to make some lip service. But essentially, you can't really, you know, make appeal sort of or, or make a claim on, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and make a reference to the Constitution because it's toothless. I mean, everything, as you say, is, is centralized. The president signs executive orders. Everything is so compartmentalized and, and structurally so centralized. Mm -hmm. Where are people going? I mean, it needs a really, I think, a tipping point, a turning point is some kind of critical mass of, of you know, of consciousness, of decision-making process, and of action. I mean, how do you how do you see this whole situation? Okay, so no, that's right. So 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 you're right, but but at the same time, like I mentioned before, rhetoric is important. So mm -hmm. so if I'm arguing with an imperialist who says, you know, you're not patriotic, well, I can throw the Constitution back in their face, and they can't really say, well, that's garbage, right? They have to argue on my terms. They have to, and so that's an advantage. More importantly. If you look at anything, right, Bitcoin is a good example. You know, it was launched, but that was years in the making. And, and, as, and as others put it, it was decades, in fact, of, of thought and, and trial and error that, that brought us to the point of having a function in Bitcoin. So you don't want to, you always want to play the long game in stuff like that. And so for me, we're still in the first inning um, of changing this thing. And in the first inning, second inning, the most important thing is ideological framework, political philosophy 
what do we what what do we want to do what makes sense and then convincing people either to agree with you or to think just think about it and we're not doing enough of that right now and this is the problem like we don't want necessarily we don't like if a crisis came tomorrow would we even have the communities would we have the the thinking the ideology ready to advance i don't know you know so we need to build that right now so i guess what i'm saying is the foundation of change is going to come from ideas and it's going to come from talking it's going to come from thinking it's going to come from influencing each other and then the rest follows and that's just the grassroots sort of um framework that i believe in and that's why i'm 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 encouraging people through my localism series to just like forget about dc okay it's, it's pointless it's worthless like don't even give them any credit work in your communities and as i wrote in part two and you mentioned you thought it was interesting this the psilocybin right the the, the 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 mushrooms right the psychedelic plants that two cities in the united states have decriminalized um think about that i mean you know in denver you know it's decriminalized you know the, oh, the, the cops yeah. really can't put any, any yeah. funds that's right outside of where i live that's yeah. a big deal okay yeah. washington dc is not doing anything about that okay so so you can have a big impact even where i live colorado was the first state in the country to legalize res, uh, recreational mar uh, cannabis and now it's everywhere you know it's all across the country and and washington dc didn't do anything to make that happen you know they were probably pretty they were pretty upset for a while and people thought that they were going to crack down but they didn't because it's the will of the people at the grassroots i right. can't emphasize that enough like if you build the movements um and the ideology at the grassroots and they're, they're strongest that way because you're not begging some politician you're not calling your representative that is you being a slave essentially they're not gonna they don't care <laughs> so so to me work do it mix it up at the local level take some action at, at the end of the day you know if enough people decide enough you know, I'm not, I'm not doing, I'm not going to go along with this anymore, right? The politicians will, 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 will cower in fear and wet themselves. That's what happens. Really, it is. Um, they're, they're just, they're just, they're just, they're just corrupt cowards at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, as you mentioned, apathy. Yeah, I mean, there's apathy everywhere. So, you know, until that stops, you know, we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to get the kind of government we deserve. We're going to get the kind of treatment that we, that we're going to, we're going to get. Um, you know, some people, someone said to me this the other day, they're like, well, when are we going to just like, you know, stand up and revolt? And I was like, okay, well, what do you mean by revolt? You really think like taking guns and, and it's, this is the stupidest thing. I mean, yes. Like if you, if someone's coming to your home and you need to defend yourself, whatever. Okay. But we haven't tried anything yet that we can do. I mean, where's the big boycott movement of, of big companies, let's say, you know what I mean? Like Facebook is, is, is a clear and present pernicious disgusting force in the world and you know you hear quit facebook but i mean i deleted facebook who you know nobody mm -hmm. you know most people didn't so again we're just we're not serious yet you know some of us are serious but most people aren't serious and um you mentioned consciousness so i don't know if you read this series it's probably my favorite series i've ever written it's on spiral dynamics are you familiar with spiral dynamics no no what's right. that you probably you'd probably like it so it's, it's a theory of the evolution of consciousness um it's been around since the 70s and it's the idea that consciousness actually can evolve within humans um it's not something you can make happen sort of something that just sort of happens for whatever reason and there are different sort of levels of, of this um and one of the guys who's big in this is this guy ken wilbur and you know he his theory has been that once there's first tier thinking and second tier thinking i'm not going to get all into it because it's going to confuse everybody but you should read the series just go to my website and, and, and type in spiral dynamics five part series um he thinks that once 10 percent of the world population is is on the second tier of thinking that the whole world will essentially change and that and that's i think we agree on that i mean you you, you know you can create all the structures you want you can say all the things you want but until people are actually ready and understand and have a different outlook um the, the people aren't obsessed with with controlling other people people aren't obsessed with just getting everything they can just for themselves uh until until people not get 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 in their own heads change not not you know it's it's harder to change yourself than it is to complain about other people but most people just want to complain about other people. Right. So until we get to that other point where people are more focused on, on themselves and they realize, hey, by the way, I interact with 20 people in a day. 
if my interactions with those 20 people are really nice, extra nice, does that affect the world? My, my answer is it does affect the world. Um, but people don't think that way. Most people don't think that way. Um, then the world will, can change. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a combination of a lot of things from my perspective. Technology is huge. Bitcoin tools that allow us to express ourselves in a more conscious way is hugely important. And that's why Bitcoin is such an important thing to me. I, structures and ideas, political philosophy, as I'm getting into, important as well. But all of this fails unless we are more conscious as people. As, until the human race is, becomes more conscious, we're going to keep making the same mistakes over and over and over. So yeah, that's important. But look, the problem with that is, you know, that's, we can only change ourselves. You know, we can only work on ourselves. You can't make someone else more conscious. It's not possible. Yeah, no, um, Michael, you, yeah, you do, I'm totally with you on that because it's uh, consciousness. I mean, for me, it's a multi-conditional, um, multi-fact uh, sort of fa factor uh, um, uh, thing. Um, there's a lot of factors and parameters and conditions. And, and of course, I understand, you know, experience, pain points, suffering, and, and be, becoming creative. And I, I think a lot of people, especially children, have not really or have dislearned or how do you call it, like have forgotten how to question things, how to, mm -hmm. you know, ask things, be, be more curious, like keeping this inner childish or childlike, um, mm -hmm. you know, attitude. So I think it's really multifaceted, but I find it fascinating your approach because, you know, also with psilocybin, I think, uh, to be honest with you, I mean, uh, I, I do think the people who are ready, they do, they do, uh, take the shortcut to, you know, uh, confront themselves with their own fears and, and misunderstandings. And it's all about comprehension. So to tie this in again, and to wrap this up with Bitcoin, what, um, what would need to happen? Do you think, first of all, is, is the critical mass in the next 10 years ready to adopt Bitcoin? Or, or do you think some things need to happen? Like uh, people need to experience like people in Venezuela, Iran, or Argentina, you know what I'm saying? Like, do, yeah. people, do people need pain points in order to uh, accelerate this process of, of, of whatever, critical adoption and, and, and really building new structures on this new right. monetary ruling? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. So, I mean, I think a lot of it, it has to do with generations. Um, and, and, and from what I see, you know, I'm, I'm like by the definitions of de generations, whether you put any stock into that or not, I'm like very late Gen X or maybe almost cusp of a millennial, but really Gen X, late Gen X. Um, but I see for younger people, you know, my wife is, is young, quite a bit younger than me and she's a millennial and I, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of people like 10 years younger than me. Uh, I see what, you know, the environment that they went into versus the environment that I went into. You know, I was sort of like at that last, last gasp where, you know, there was an ability to come get in there and do pretty well for yourself. And, uh, you know, th that generation just got completely messed up. And uh, the way the bailouts were hand handled, the criminal and corrupt way they were handled, you know, essentially just bailed out people that were wealthy already and older and had assets. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, I see Bitcoin in the context of that as well. And I think that's actually one of the things that protects it. Um, the most, you know, particularly those people who I think are short-sighted and they're like, well, the government's just going to outlaw it or ban it or whatever. You know, you're facing uh, a gen an entire generation that feels that they've been completely shafted. And for like the boomers, because that's essentially who would be doing it, right? The, the banning of Bitcoin or whatever they might, whatever silliness they might try, it would be seen in that context. And that's going to make their job a lot harder. So I do, I do believe that in, 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 in a lot of ways, um, a tailwind that Bitcoin has going forward in the years ahead is this, is this fact that you've got an entire generation that feels completely stuck, trapped, and cheated. And a lot of them, the a lot of the smartest people from that generation have adopted Bitcoin um, in a completely rational manner. I mean, not, not just because uh, they believe in the principles. In some cases, it's as simple as, you know what? This is my rebellion. You know, this is my way of saying, I don't want your system. This is a better system. And I might make some money off of it. So I think that's going to play an important role going forward. I do think, though, that um, the macro environment that we're going into is going to be a huge tailwind as well. You know, we're, we, we are, you see what central banks are doing. You, you, you know, look at, look at what they've already done to bonds. I mean, you're at the point where, you know, when you have an entire gigantic, the biggest financial asset class in the world, bonds, you know, so many of them trading at negative yields. Or, I mean, you're starting to get to the point where you have nowhere, you know, people are going to look around and say like, I have nowhere else to go. Where am I going to go? 
And I think Bitcoin is going to be one of those answers. But beyond that, um, just the just the reality of you know failing governments uh, trying to re you know restrict people from using money in the way they want to use it. Bitcoin's use case is only going to go up um, in the years ahead. So I think that uh, it's a lot of things together, but I think, I think mostly, I mean, the, the biggest driver is going to be circumstances of, of Bitcoin appreci uh, appreciation, you know, uh, um, you know, I, I still have a lot of friends in the financial industry, traditional financial industry, and uh, I do podcasts with them and interviews. I thought one of the more recent ones I did was with this guy, very smart person. He gets everything. He's heard about Bitcoin forever. It aligns with his philosophy, but, but he just never pulled the trigger. And then I did a podcast with him and he said, you know what? I, I, I'm in now. You know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little bit in, not, you know, 1% or whatever of his assets, but he, I convinced him. You know, but what's, what's interesting to me about that was there's still so much low hanging fruit of people to come around. Um, and for whatever reason, a lot of people, particularly in the, in the traditional finance industry, even those that agree in principle with a lot of Bitcoin, just can't do it. You know, they can't do it or they don't get it enough. Right. I mean, this guy didn't even know about the, you know, he didn't know about the having it, ha having or anything like that. It's important, but that's the thing, you know, people, people in Bitcoin need to realize that, most people have no idea, you know what I mean? Like what it is, how it works, why it's important. And so, yeah, I think what's going to create um, more critical adoption and appreciation for it is, is all these people. And it's the vast, 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 vast majority. I mean, when you ask someone, have you heard about Bitcoin? That, that's, that's pointless. That doesn't mean anything, right? Do you, do you understand it on any level, on any meaningful level at all? The, the, the percentage of population that does understand it on any meaningful level is minuscule, minuscule. I'm not talking about like, you know, an Andreas or like, you know, these people. I'm talking about like even understanding it, the very basics of how it works, almost nobody. So uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit there. And I think it's going to be picked in the years ahead. Right. What, what is the intention of your articles? I mean, I know it's about educate, educating the people and, you know, bring a new perspectives, but what is your, what would really fascinate you, what is your bigger vision? I mean, where do you see, you know, uh, in connection with Bitcoin, society, civilization? I mean. Yeah. yeah. So, so for me, um, what first started it was I felt like, first of all, I was in a position to, to not worry about um, money that much. After I left Wall Street, I was completely single. I, I had a bunch of savings. I moved from New York, very expensive to a far cheaper place, Colorado. And, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to give, I'm going to give back a little bit here. You know, uh, my, my, my goal is essentially like, I, I worked in this industry for 10 years. You know, I, I have knowledge, right? I have a perspective that I think is valuable and important, right? I, and I'm going to, and I'm going to put it out there and people, you know, enjoyed it. And, um, and I felt, you know, I've affected some people's lives, you know, in meaningful ways that they've told me. And since then, it's, it's, I, I take it every day, one step at a time. You know, is this what I still want to be doing? Can I keep doing this? Does it make sense? Am I having an impact? Am I growing as a person? All, all of these things. I mean, if you look back to my writing from 10 years ago versus now, very different, you know, uh, even with my blog, how I've done things. So I'm changing as a person. I'm evolving. I'm learning. I mean, I love what I do, even though it's, you know, you don't make much money off of it um, because every day I'm learning, you know, and, and every day I'm giving in some way uh, without expecting anything in return. And, you know, that's, that's actually pretty powerful and it feels pretty good because one of the things um, that try, I try to guide my life by is don't get attached, right? And this isn't my, you know, this is like Eastern philosophy you know, 101, but don't get attached to the outcome. You know, don't, don't, it's not about winning. You know, it's not about um, getting what you want, you know, getting in, in your lifetime. Even. And having children makes you have this perspective as well. You know, it's like you're giving for them, you know, without expecting something from them in return. I mean, some parents do, or they're like, you need to be this, but not for me. You know, for me, it's like, I want my children. I'm like a guide to them. I want them to be the best that they can be. And so that's really just what I do. I don't, I don't have, um, if, I, if I affect people, if I impact the world on some level, eventually, great. If I don't, that's fine too. Because, you know, I, I feel like I have a lot I want to get off my chest. I feel like I have stuff to say. 
And as long as there are people that want to hear it and find it useful, I'm going to try to do it. Um, but you know, who knows, right? If someone told me 10 years ago, I'd be doing this interview right now, I'd say you're crazy, you know? Uh, but so, so in 10 years, who knows what I'm going to be doing? I have no idea. I'm not making anybody any promises. I'm just living my life, trying to, trying to figure things out and be a better person and, you know, add value where I can add value without expecting anything in return. And, uh, and it's been nice, you know, it's, it's, it's not always perfect, you know, and I could be making a fortune <laughs> right now if I stayed, uh, on Wall Street, but I would be less happy, um, for sure. And, uh, you know, I discovered a lot of things I didn't know growing up in New York City that I like. I, you know, I, I was very disconnected from nature growing up in Manhattan. You know, you don't, you, if you've ever been there, you know what it's like. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't see besides the stars. Besides the Central Park, besides the Central yeah. Park. <laughs> right, but, but, right, exactly. But it's a, you know, which is beautiful, but it's a very manufactured green space. Right. Um, you know, now I'm in the mountain, you know, right on the foothills of the mountains, you know, bear, a bear was in my backyard three years ago. You know what I mean? I love that. And uh, I gardening is, is become a huge passion for me. I love, love gardening. It's uh, as much as writing. I love it. I love being a father. So uh, I don't have this like um, exalted expectation of what my life is going to, to impact. It's uh, I'm just, I'm just doing what I feel like feels right. Um, and it's, and I, and it gives me a lot of satisfaction. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your work. I think you're, you know, great contribute, you know, contribution to, to uh, what do, what do we call it? Evolution, right? I mean, <laughs> because I always say we don't have time for revolutions. It's right. really time for evolution because Agreed. we really to uh, really, uh, I don't know, process a lot of things, but, but, um, uh, have a new way of thinking and, and perspective and, and yes. you know, build new structures. And, and I eventually, uh, that's my hope, you know, a lot of things that have been suppressed will come to the surface. Mm -hmm. especially positive ones, technologies, you know, like serving humanity. So eventually this is where I see Bitcoin. This is why I'm asking you this, you know, what is your vision? And uh, besides, you know, the monetary economic financial structure, you know, what is beyond Bitcoin? What, what, is, what happens when Bitcoin really is rooted into the structure of our civilization? So, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to your next article, uh, Michael. Uh, anything else, like any information besides your website, liberty, libertyblitzkrieg.com? Okay, yeah, so really, libertyblitzkrieg.com is where I've been writing for almost a decade, since 2012. Uh, I don't have any ads on the site. I don't have any sponsor, you know, like ad corporate or whatever sponsors. Um, it's donations, so if you like what I do or say or anything, you can feel free. If, if not, that's fine, too. Um, you can just go to my support page. And also, very active on Twitter, at Liberty Blitz. I tweet all the time. Um, that's really where I'm putting a lot on the blog usually. So that's where you can find my stuff and uh, I hope people check it out. And that spiral dynamics, um, I think that's another series that people really could get into it. A lot of people, either you're, either you're gonna you know, think it's great and it's gonna change your way of thinking or you're gonna think it's complete nonsense. Either way, check it out. Either way, we learn. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. anyway, Michael, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to you know, reading more stuff of yours and hopefully getting back to you soon you know, uh, in the near future. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, I enjoy this. All right, Michael. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, so how'd you love this interview? I found it amazingly fascinating. Sorry about the, you know, a uh, couple of times the glitches. This is why really I wouldn't need more financial support, uh, ethical sponsoring, so I can do, you know, highest quality video and, and, and or audio quality live personal face-to-face -face interview. So, Hope you loved it. Um, I'm going to put all the additional information and, and uh, resources and uh, articles of Michael Krieger in the show notes. And if you want to, please leave me a positive review if you loved it on Apple Podcasts, any other podcast platform. Follow me, subscribe on YouTube, on Twitter. Um, that would really help me. And, you know, retweet, reshare, whatever you can do. Uh, really appreciate your support and listening and uh, you know, spreading this knowledge um, so we can have an exponential monetary, economical, financial, societal, so structural, technological, scientific, and spiritual evolution. This is what we need. We need really true freedom. And this is only, uh, you know, this can only be done through a process of, you know, creating consciousness and, 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 and knowledge and wisdom and, and connecting it all together, you know, connecting the dots. That's why, you know, it's called also the total connector show. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for support and listening. And I hope to, you know, uh, 
hear back from you soon. All right, have a good day. Thank you.